Yesterday I was trying to fill in some gaps from the Buddha's life, first 20 years, and then started with reading about Lady Visaka and giving an introduction to the another monastery in Savati, the palace of Migara's mother. And at this point, we come to where the Vinaya, the Patimokha, is starting to be formulated. The occasion was this, so this is from the Vinaya. <clears throat> Blessed One was living at Rajagaha on the Vulture Peak Rock, and at that time the wanderers of other sects were in the habit of meeting together on the half moons of the 14th and 15th and the quarter moon of the 8th and preaching about their Dhamma. People went to hear about the Dhamma from them. They grew fond of the wanderers of other sects and believed in them, so the wanderers gained support. Now while Saniya Bimbisara, king of Magadha, was alone in retreat, he considered thus, and he thought, he considered this, and he thought, why should the venerable ones not meet together too on these days? Then he went to the blessed one and told him what he had thought, adding, Lord, it would be good if the venerable ones met together too on these days. So this is the origin of the Lunar Observance Day, and the Buddha's living in the Gandakuti on the Vulture Peak. The Blessed One instructed the king with talk on the Dhamma, after which the king departed. Then the Blessed One made this the occasion for a discourse on the Dhamma, and he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, I allow meetings on the half moons of the 14th and 15th and the quarter moon of the 8th. So the bhikkhus met together on those days as allowed by the Blessed One, and they sat in silence. People went to hear the Dhamma, but they were annoyed and they murmured and protested. How can these monks, sons of the Sakyans, meet together on these days and sit in silence as dumb as hogs? Ought not the Dhamma be preached when they meet? Bhikkhus heard this. They went to the Blessed One and told him. He made this the occasion for a discourse on the Dhamma, and he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, when there is a meeting on the half moons and of the 14th and the 15th and the quarter moon of the 8th, I allow preaching of the Dhamma. An account is given in the Vinaya Pitaka of events that led to the constitution of the Patimokha, or the co Code of Rules. The account is very long, and so here is a summary version. And this is the story of Venerable Sudhinna, the Parajika One, the origin story for Parajika One, the first Parajika rule against sexual intercourse. And so uh, I might omit whatever sentences might not be suitable for a live stream recording. Actually, this isn't live streamed, but suitable for a posted, uh, online posted recording. Sudhinna was the son of a rich merchant of Kalanda, a village near Vesali. He was married, but without children. He heard the Buddha preach in Vesali, and as a result, he asked for the going forth, but he was told he must get his parents' consent. There was a protracted struggle with them, and it was only after he had refused to eat that they gave in. Later on, after he had gone into homelessness, there was a famine, and he thought, suppose I lived supported by my family. Relatives will provide the gifts for my support, and in that way, they will earn merit, and the bhikkhus will benefit, and I shall not go short of alms food. His relatives at Vesali brought him plenty of offerings. One day he went to Kalanda with his bull, and he came to his father's house without, however, announcing himself. A servant girl recognized him and told his father, who pressed him to come for the next day's meal. When he came the next day, his parents used all their arts to persuade him to return to the lay life. His mother told him, Sudina, our family is rich with vast possessions. For this reason, you must beget an heir. Do not let the Lichavis take over our heirless property. He answered, I can do that, mother. 
So his mother brought his former wife to him in the great wood. He took her into the wood. Seeing no harm, since no training rule had been made known, he had intercourse with her. As a result, she conceived. Then the earth deities set up a clamor. Good sirs, though the Sangha of Bhikkhus has hitherto been free from infection and free from dangers, yet infection and danger has been, are being sown in it by Sudina, the, the Kalandian. <clears throat> and the cry was taken up through all the heavens till it reached the Brahma world. So this is similar to the Dhammachaka Pawatana Sutta, starting with the Bhuma Devas and up through all the Deva realms, the cry being heard, but this is a negative cry being heard up all through to the Brahma world. The Venerable Sudhina's former wife gave birth to a son. Friends called him Bijaka, which means seed, and they called his mother Bijaka's mother. And they called the Venerable Sudhina Bijaka's father. Later on, Bijaka and his mother both left the home life and went forth into homelessness. So there was no heir in the end. But the Venerable Sudhina grew remorseful. Because of his bad conscience, he became thin and wretched. When bhikkhus asked him what was wrong, he confessed. They rebuked him, and the matter was brought before the Blessed One. The Blessed One said, Misguided man, it is unfitting, unseemly, improper, and unworthy of a monk. It is unrighteous and must not be done. How can you not live out the holy life in complete perfection and purity after going forth into homelessness in a dhamma and discipline as well proclaimed as this? Misguided man, have I not taught the dhamma in various ways for the sake of dispassion, not for the sake of passion? Have I not taught the dhamma for the sake of unfettering, not for the sake of fettering? Have I not taught the dhamma for the sake of relinquishing, not for the sake of clinging? The Dhamma was taught by me for dispassion, unfettering, and relinquishment. You would conceive to be for this Dhamma you would conceive to be for passion, fettering, and clinging. Has the Dhamma not been taught by me in many ways for dispassion, for disintoxication, for curing thirst, for abolishing attachment, for severing the round of being, for exhausting craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for nibbana? Have I not described in many ways the abandoning of sensual pleasures, the full understanding of perceptions of sensual desire, the curing of thirst for sensual desires, the eradication of thoughts of sensual desires, the allaying of the fever of sensual desires? Misguided man, um, By this act, you would pursue the Dhamma's opposite. You would pursue the low, vulgar ideal that is impure and ends in ablution, that is done in secrecy by couples. You are the first to give effect to more than a few wrong ideas. This neither rouses faith in the faithless nor increases faith in the faithful. Rather, it keeps the faithless without faith and harms some of the faithful. And uh, that phrase, this neither this, uh, you are the first to give effect to more than a few wrong ideas. And that, that's very true. And even in the suttas, you'll get monks later on who develop the view that, that engaging in sexual intercourse isn't an obstruction to the path. And uh, there's other rules formulated about that later. Then when he had rebuked the Venerable Sudhina, who was not expelled since no rule had been made yet. So with all the rules, then the first offender doesn't, doesn't fall under that rule. After giving an appropriate talk on the Dhamma, he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, because of this, I shall constitute a training rule for bhikkhus. I shall do so for 10 reasons, for the welfare of the Sangha, for the comfort of the Sangha, for the restraint of the evil-minded, for the support of virtuous bhikkhus, for the restraint of taints in this life, for the prevention of taints in the life to come, for the benefit of unbelievers, for growth in believers, for the establishment of the good Dhamma, and for ensuring rules for restraint. The first training rule should be made known thus. Any bhikkhu who engages in sexual intercourse is defeated. He is no more in communion. 
that is how this training rule was made known by the Blessed One. So that, that's uh, the first Parajika rule, which is the first rule of defeat, meaning that if any bhikkhu does that, they're automatically no longer a monk and they can, cannot ordain again in this lifetime. This is another part, jumping to another part of the Vinaya. Once while the Blessed One was alone in retreat, this thought arose in his mind. Suppose I allowed the training rules already made known by me to, the, to be recited by the bhikkhus as their patimoka. That would be their uposita day observance, their holy day observance. When it was evening, he rose from retreat and making this the occasion for a talk on the Dhamma, he addressed the bhikkhus and told them of his decision. And then this, this next story takes place at the palace of Migara's mother. And it's about the, uh, when the bhikkhu, or when the Buddha stopped attending the Padimokas. The occasion was this. The Blessed One was living at Savati in the palace of Migara's mother, the Eastern Park. It was then the Oposita day and the Blessed One was sitting surrounded by the Sangha of bhikkhus. Well on into the night, when the first watch was ended, the Venerable Ananda rose from his seat, and arranging his robe on one shoulder, he raised his hands, palms together, toward the Blessed One, and said, Lord, it is now well into the night, and the first watch is ended. The Sangha of bhikkhus has been sitting long. Let the Blessed One recite the Patimoka to the bhikkhus. When this was said, the Blessed One remained silent. A second time, well on into the night, when the second watch was ended, the Venerable Ananda rose from his seat and arranged his robe on one shoulder. He raised his hands, palms together toward the Blessed One and said, Lord, it is now well on into the night and the second watch is ended. The Sangha of bhikkhus has been sitting long. Let the Blessed One recite the Patimoka to the bhikkhus. A second time, the Blessed One remained silent. A third time, well on into the night, when the third watch was ended, with the red dawn coming up and joy on the face of the night, the Venerable Ananda rose from his seat, and arranging his robe on one shoulder, he raised his hands, palms together toward the Blessed One, and said, Lord, it is now well on into the night, and the third watch is ended, with the dawn coming up. The Sangha of bhikkhus has been sitting long. Let the Blessed One recite the Patimoka to the bhikkhus. The assembly is not pure, Ananda. Then the Venerable Maha Moggallana thought, who is the person referred to by the Blessed One in saying that? He read with his mind the minds of the whole Sangha of bhikkhus. He saw that person, unvirtuous, wicked, unclean, of suspect habits, secretive in his acts, no monk but claiming to be one, nor no leader of the holy life but claiming to do so, rotten within, libidinous and full of corruption, sitting in the midst of the Sangha. He went up to him and said, Get up, friend, you are seen by the Blessed One. For you there is no living in communion with the Sangha of bhikkhus. When this was said, that person remained silent. When it was said to him a second and a third time, he remained silent. Then the Venerable Maha Moggallana took him by the arm and put him outside the door, which he, which he bolted. He went to the Blessed One and said, Lord, I have ejected that person. The assembly is now pure. Let the Blessed One recite the Patimoka to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. It is wonderful, Moggallana. It is marvelous how that misguided man waited till he was taken by the arm. Then the Blessed One addressed the Bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, from now on I shall not participate in the Uposita. I shall not recite the Patimoka. From now on you yourselves will participate in the Uposita and recite the Patimoka. It is impossible, it cannot happen, that a perfect one should participate in the Uposita and recite the Patimoka in an unpurified assembly. Bhikkhus, there are eight wonderful and marvelous qualities of the great ocean that the Asura demons delight in whenever they see them. So too there are eight wonderful and marvelous qualities of this Dhamma and discipline that bhikkhus delight in whenever they see them. What are these eight? Just as the great ocean gradually slopes and inclines and shelves without any sudden drop, 
So too, in this Dhamma and discipline, there is gradual training and work and practice without any sudden penetration of final knowledge. Again, just as the great ocean is stable and keeps within the limits of its ebb and flow without exceeding them, so too my disciples transgress no training rules made known by me. Again, just as the great ocean will not tolerate a dead body, but when there is a dead body in it, soon casts it ashore, throws it up on dry land, so too the Sangha does not tolerate a person who is unvirtuous, wicked, of suspect habits, secretive of his acts, no monk but claiming to be one, not leading the holy life, but claiming to do so, rotten within, libidinous and full of corruption, but when it has met together, it soon throws him out. And even though he may be sitting in the midst of the Sangha, he is yet far from the Sangha, and the Sangha is far from him. Again, just as all the great rivers, the Ganges, the Yamuna, the Achiryawati, the Sarabhu, and the Mahi, give up their former names and identities when they reach the great ocean, and they come to be reckoned as one with the great ocean itself, so too there are these four castes, the warrior noble Katyas, the Brahmin priests, the Vesas, and the Sudas. And when they have gone forth from the house life into homelessness in the Dhamma and discipline declared by the perfect one, they give up their former name and clan and come to be reckoned one with the bhikkhus who are sons of the Sakyans. Again, just as the great rivers in the world flow into the great ocean and the rains from the sky fall into it, Yet for all that, the great ocean is never described as not full or full. So too, though many bhikkhus attain final nibbana by the nibbana element without result of past clinging left, yet for all that, the nibbana element is never described as not full or full. Again, just as the great ocean has one taste, the taste of salt, so too this dhamma in discipline has one taste, the taste of liberation. Again, just as the great ocean holds many and various treasures, there are such treasures in it as pearls, crystals, barrels, shells, marbles, corals, silver, gold, rubies, opals. So too, this Dhamma and discipline holds many and various treasures. There are such treasures in it as the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right endeavors, the four bases for success, the five spiritual faculties, the five powers, the seven enlightenment factors, and the noble eightfold path. And that list is a special list, the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, Wings to Awakening. Again, just as the great ocean is the abode of great beings, there are such beings in it as whales, sea serpents, demons, monsters, and tritons. And in the great ocean, there are creatures whose persons are a hundred leagues, two, three, four, five hundred leagues in size. So too, this Dhamma and discipline is the abode of great beings. There are such beings in it as the stream enterer and one who has entered the way to the fruit of stream entry, the once returner and one who's on the path to once returning, the non-returner and one who is on the path to non-returning, the arhant and the one who has entered upon the path to arhantship. Knowing the meaning of this, the Blessed One uttered this exclamation, Rain soddens what is kept wrapped up, but never soddens what is open. Uncover then what is concealed, lest it be soddened by the rain. And then I'll, uh, I was going to read some excerpts from a sutta. And this also illustrates the way the Buddha trained people personally, but also his forgiveness and how he, when people saw their transgressions or their faults, they're able to rectify it. It's not that the Buddha just turned his back on them and didn't give them any way out. This is Majjhima Nikaya 65, Badali Sutta to Badali. <coughs> So this is the monk, about the monk, Baddali.
and it also deals with another rule the Buddha laid down, which was controversial, which was uh, at first the bhikkhus were able to go alms around any any time of the day, but then over time that changed, and the the Buddha that wasn't convenient for the lay people, so the Buddha made it so that the monks would only go after dawn and before noon, so that was considered at the right time. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, I eat in a, in a single session. By doing so, I am free from illness and affliction, and I enjoy health, strength, and a comfortable of abiding. Come, bhikkhus, eat at a single session. By doing so, you too will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy health, strength, and a comfortable abiding. There's a note on that. This refers to the Buddha's practice of eating a single meal in the, in the forenoon only. According to the Patimokkha, the bhikkhus are prohibited from eating from noon until the following dawn, though the single session practice is only recommended but not required. When this was said, the Venerable Badali told the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I am not willing to eat at a single session, for if I were to do so, I might have worry and anxiety about it. Then Badali, eat one part there where you are invited and bring away one part to eat. By eating in that way, you will maintain yourself. Venerable Sir, I am not willing to eat in that way either, for if I were to do so, I might also have worry and anxiety about it. So he essentially he can't give up eating dinner. And uh, this notes are saying he would be worried and anxious whether he could live the holy life for his entire life. His anxiety persisted because he would still have to finish his meal of the remains by noon. Then, when this training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, the Venerable Badali publicly declared in the Sangha of Bhikkhus his unwillingness to undertake the training. Then the Venerable Badali did not present himself to the Blessed One for the whole of that three-month period of the rains, as he did not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. Now on that occasion, a number of Bhikkhus were engaged in making up a robe for the Blessed One, thinking, with his robe completed at the end of the three months of the rains, the Blessed One will set out wandering. Then the Venerable Badali went to those bhikkhus and exchanged greetings with them. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. When he had done so, they said to him, Friend Badali, this robe is being made up for the Blessed One. With his robe completed at the end of the three months of the rains, the Blessed One will set out wandering. Please, friend Badali, give proper attention to your declaration. Do not let it become more difficult for you later on. Yes, friends, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said, Venerable Sir, a transgression overcame me, and that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, I publicly declared in the Sangha of Bhikkhus my unwillingness to undertake the training. Venerable Sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as such, for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by me, you publicly declared in the Sangha of Bhikkhus your unwillingness to undertake the training. Badali, this circumstance was not recognized by you, the Blessed One is living at Savati, and the Blessed One will know me thus. The bhikkhu named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. This circumstance was not recognized by you. Also, this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many bhikkhus have taken up residence at Savati for the rains, and they too will know me thus. The bhikkhu named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. 
this circumstance was not recognized by you. Venerable sir, a transgression overcame me in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, I publicly declared in the Sangha of Bhikkhus my unwillingness to undertake the training. Venerable sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as such, for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by me, you publicly declared in the Sangha of Bhikkhus your unwillingness to undertake the training. What do you think, Badali? Suppose a bhikkhu here were one liberated in both ways, and I told him, come bhikkhu, be a plank for me to walk across the mud. Would he walk across himself, or would he dispose his body otherwise, or would he say no? No, venerable sir. So essentially, it's like a, the Buddha saying, if he asked a liberated bhikkhu to do anything for him, he would just do it without even thinking about thinking twice about it. What do you think, Badali? Suppose a bhikkhu, uh, a bhikkhu here were one liberated by wisdom, a body witness, one attained to view, one liberated by faith, a dhamma follower, a faith follower. And I told him, come bhikkhu, be a plank for me to walk across the mud. Would he walk across himself, or would he dispose his body otherwise, or would he say no? No, venerable sir. What do you think, Badali? Were you on that occasion one liberated in both ways, or one liberated by wisdom, or a body witness, or one attained to view, or one liberated by faith, or a Dhamma follower, or a faith follower? No, venerable sir. Badali, on that occasion, were you not an empty, hollow, wrongdoer? Yes, venerable sir. Venerable sir, a transgression overcame me, and that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, I publicly declared in the Sangha of Bhikkhus my unwillingness to undertake the training. Venerable sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgressions, seen as such, for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by me, you publicly declared in the Sangha of Bhikkhus your unwillingness to undertake the training. But since you see your transgression as such and make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you. For it is growth in the Noble One's discipline when one sees one's transgression as such and makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma by undertaking restraint for the future. Here, Badali, some bhikkhu does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. He considers thus, Suppose I were to resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. Perhaps I might realize a superhuman state, a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. He resorts to some such secluded resting place. While he lives thus withdrawn, the teacher censures him. Wise companions in the holy life who have made investigations censure him. Deities censure him, and he censures himself. Being censured in this way by the teacher, by wise companions in the holy life, by deities, and by himself, he realizes no superhuman state, no distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Why is that? That is how it is with one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. Here, Badali, some bhikkhu does fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. He considers thus, suppose I were to resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. Perhaps I might realize a superhuman state, a distinction, knowledge, and vision worthy of the noble ones, he resorts to some such secluded resting place. While he lives thus withdrawn, the teacher does not censure him. Wise companions in the holy life who have made investigation do not censure him. Deities do not censure him, and he does not censure himself. Being uncensured in this way by the teacher, by wise companions in the holy life, by deities and by himself, 
he realizes a superhuman state, a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. And then it goes through many paragraphs of entering upon abiding in the four jhanas and the triple knowledge. That is how he is one who fulfills the training and the teacher's dispensation. Thereupon the venerable Badali asked, Venerable Sir, what is the cause, what is the reason, why they take action against some bhikkhu here by repeatedly admonishing him? What is the cause, what is the reason, why they do not take such action against some bhikkhu here by repeatedly admonishing him? Here, Badali, some bhikkhu is a constant offender with many offenses. When he is corrected by the bhikkhus, he prevaricates, leads the talk aside, shows disturbance, hate, and bitterness. He does not proceed rightly. He does not comply. He does not clear himself. He does not say, let me act so that the sangha will be satisfied. Bhikkhus, taking account of this matter, think, it would be good if, bhikkhus, taking account of this matter, think, it would be good if the venerable ones examine this bhikkhu in such a way that this litigation against him is not settled too quickly. And the bhikkhus examine that bhikkhu in such a way that the litigation against him is not settled too quickly. So that's uh, if somebody is habitually, this comes up again and again in the Vinaya, although this, this particular phrase from the suttas, that particular, if a bhikkhu has a lot of different offenses and won't stop committing offenses, it's not like, Let's just tell him briefly and and forget about it. It's no, we have to keep focusing on this. But here, some bhikkhu is a constant offender with many offenses. When he is corrected by the bhikkhus, he does not prevaricate, lead the talk aside, or show disturbance, hate, and bitterness. He proceeds rightly. He complies. He clears himself. He says, "Let me act. Let me so act, so the sangha will be satisfied." Bhikkhus, taking account of this matter, think, it would be good if the venerable ones examine this bhikkhu in such a way that this litigation against him is settled quickly. So this is someone who, although he might fall into offenses often, he try, he's trying and clears himself quickly each time. So they're thinking, well, okay, we don't need to, he's, act, he's trying, we don't need to focus on this, we don't need to put so much work into this. And the bhikkhus examine that bhikkhu in such a way that the litigation against him is settled quickly. Here some bhikkhu is a chance offender without many offenses. When he is corrected by the bhikkhus, he prevaricates and he doesn't, uh, he has all those unwholesome qualities. The bhikkhus examine that bhikkhu in such a way that the litigation against him is not settled too quickly. But here some bhikkhu is a chance offender without many offenses. When he is corrected by the bhikkhus, he is easy, and the bhikkhus examine that bhikkhu in such a way that the litigation against him is settled quickly. And then this, this next paragraph is, is quite interesting, and this has come up in my mind from time to time over the years when, when coming to pointing things out to people. Here some bhikkhu progresses with a measure of faith and love. So he's kind of on the ropes, essentially. This, in this case, bhikkhus consider thus. Friends, this bhikkhu progresses by a measure of faith and love. Let him not lose that measure of faith and love, as he may if we take action against him by repeatedly admonishing him. Suppose a man had only one eye, then his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives would guard his eye, thinking, let him not lose his one eye. So too, some bhikkhu progresses by a measure of faith and love. Let him not lose that measure of faith and love as he may if we take action against him by repeatedly admonishing him. This is the cause, this is the reason why they take action against some bhikkhu here by repeatedly admonishing him. This is the cause, this is the reason why they do not take such action against some bhikkhu here by repeatedly admonishing him. There were few of you, Badali, when I taught the Dhamma through the simile of the young thoroughbred colt. Do you remember that, Badali? No, Venerable Sir. To what reason do you attribute that? Venerable Sir, I have, lo I have long been one who did not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. 
That is not the only cause or the only reason, but rather by encompassing your mind with my mind, I have long known you thus. When I am teaching the Dhamma, this misguided man does not heed it, does not give it attention, does not engage it with all his mind, does not hear the Dhamma with eager ears. Still, Badali, I will teach you the Dhamma through the simile of the young thoroughbred colt. Listen it and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Badali replied. This for me, this is like a good example of the Buddha displaying his compassion. He's actually repeating something he previously taught because the monk Badali wasn't listening the first time. Badali, suppose a clever horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred colt. He first makes him get used to wearing the bit. While the colt is being made, made to get used to wearing the bit, because he is doing something that he has never done before, he displays some contortion, writhing, and vacillation. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in that action. When the colt has become peaceful in that action, the horse trainer further makes him get used to wearing the harness. While the colt is being made to get used to wearing the harness, because he is doing something he has never done before, he displays some contortion, writhing, and vacillation, but through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in that action. When the colt has become peaceful in that action, the horse trainer further makes him act in keeping in step, in running in a circle, in prancing, in galloping, in charging, in the kingly qualities, in the kingly heritage, in the highest speed, in the highest f fleetness, in the highest gentleness. While the colt is being made to get used to doing these things, because he is doing something that he has never done before, he displays some contortion, writhing, and vacillation. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in those actions. When the colt has become peaceful in those actions, the horse trainer further rewards him with a rubbing down and a grooming. When a fine thoroughbred colt possesses these ten factors, he is worthy of the king, in the king's service, and considered one of the factors of a king. So too, Badali, when a bhikkhu possesses ten qualities, he is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What are the ten? Here, Badali, a bhikkhu possesses the right view of one beyond training, the right intention of one beyond training, the right speech of one beyond training, the right action of one beyond training, the right livelihood of one beyond training, the right effort of one beyond training, the right mindfulness of one beyond training, the right concentration of one beyond training, the right knowledge of one beyond training, and the right deliverance of one beyond training. When a bhikkhu possesses these ten qualities, he is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Badali was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. I'll leave it at that for today. If there's any questions, we've got a few minutes. <laughs> Uh, when the Blessed One was acknowledging Badia, what did he mean by both body is and the mental body? What did he mean by By what? He, he asked Badia if he was a body witness or what he meant. Oh, like body. he's saying, even somebody liberated in all these different types of ways mm -hmm. would do anything for me. But you're none of those. You're not even. You're not liberated in any of those types of ways. You're still just an ordinary person. Mm -hmm. And how much more so should you do what I'm asking, essentially? Do you know specifically because the term body when it's I hadn't heard before, it seemed like a preceded uh, faith follower and dhamma follower. Yeah, at, uh, there's a few different interpretations. My, my thought is uh, it's liberated through the practice of like insight into the body, your mindfulness of the body. More mm -hmm. I seem to say about that too. Body witness. Um, well, I mean, one is a, you know, there's a strong samadhi element involved in body witness. And, uh, but then, of course, the insight as well. But the, uh, yeah, there is a different classification. I mean, the, the, uh, the more common classification of 
say, liberated and, and ways of liberation are, say, stream entry, one's return, one return, or our home, and, and sort of both path and fruit. Uh, like when we chant, let's say, the four pairs, the eight kinds of noble beings, that's what that refers to. And, and this is a completely different uh, classification. Um, the one liberated in both ways is, has all the uh, all the uh, um, levels of of form and formless meditations, and, and then through to the different the one attained to view, um, a double follower uh, is one who is uh, more reflective, investigative, uh, wisdom using of wisdom faculty. Faith follower, one who is, is more, um, yeah, the kind of faith confidence is, is more predominant. Uh, but they are ways of, of liberation. So it's a whole different <coughs> schema of, of, uh, of the uh, of, of realization. So. Yeah, so then it would have been closer to the end of his life. 